but I feel I need to try and draw some strands together. I'm here in multiple capacities and I, I want to sort of declare that at the outset in terms of the comments that I'm going to make. So I am the co-chair, one of the co-chairs of the Legal and Constitutional <coughs> Subcommittee and that subcommittee is, is one of the committees that we have of this interim uh, structure that we're trying to develop, the International African People's Parliament. And um, part of what we have been trying to do, as Sister Jackie explained in our introduction, is to ensure that we look at the legal dimensions of most of the issues of concern that oftentimes we organize around. Because everything that we do has some legal dimension. And I'm not just talking about conventional European law. I'm talking about law in its broadest and most holistic sense. And so we have created a space where we can do that. And part of it is, is raising what we call legal consciousness, which is basically the awareness that we have of our rights and also how we defend and assert our rights. And ultimately, it's about how we um, try and secure justice. But legal consciousness also relates to what is it that makes so many of us comply with systems of legalized injustice. Mm. And so legal consciousness has been an essential aspect of our liberation struggle and our freedom struggle. And as it has been pointed out, it's not about whether you have the label of a lawyer, okay? All of us have a responsibility and a duty to raise our legal <coughs> consciousness. And so that's really the foundation of this meeting. The Community Law Circle which is we meet the first Tuesday, normally <coughs> every month here, and, and that's what we do. We engage with conventional lawyers, unconventional lawyers like myself, as well as community activists and so forth, and we all come together and we struggle and we debate and we dialogue around what law is and how it applies to our lives and what are going to be the best solutions. So uh, that's one of the roles that I have. Another role that I have is, is, is in terms of being a co-chair of the Interim National Organising Committee of the Interim National African People's Parliament, and the other co-chair is Brother Lida Bandaka, um, sitting right here. And then the third role that I'm going to mention, which I think in, particularly in terms of some of the comments and in relation to the CARICOM strategy, is that within the parliament, I'm also representing at PARCO, the Pan-African Reparations Coalition in Europe, who have had some, uh, uh, certainly we've, we've been doing some work around this issue. Now, part of what we're trying to do with this uh, space and this interim structure is trying to ensure that we can come together, okay? Because it's been mentioned several times, this, this issue of power. So whatever a legal case is, whatever our legal rights are, whatever the laws say, we know that we have the right. However, do we have the power to be able to enforce our will? That is a key question. And that is not about a group of lawyers or a group of politicians, wherever they may be, sitting down and drafting a brilliant legal, technical legal strategy, and we all just sit back as bystanders and wait for the lawyers and the politicians to go and win a case, and then we all get our little compensation check. That's not what this is about. And so we recognize that part of how we address this question of power has to be about how we can unite <coughs> and harmonize our various organizational efforts and our various interests, many of which are represented here in this room. And so that unity agenda and that organizing and that institutional base is critical. In fact, a key aspect of how we can uh, build our power to be able to be an effective voice and to be able to uh, engage with so-called decision makers wherever they are and try and seek to enforce our own legal, political, historical, cultural, whatever, whatever, whatever will is around unifying all that we're trying to do because many of us in this room are already working on this question of reparations. And so that's the foundation really of some of the comments that I, I want to make. It's not about saying that we are supplanting what anyone else is doing. No, we build on that. 
And we don't just build in terms of us here in the here and now. We recognize, as Dr. Kamani has mentioned, that this is actually a historic struggle. Mm -hmm. It's not only a transnational struggle in terms of a global struggle, and I'm going to use the term global African. Um, others might use the term pan-African. But it's also transgenerational in that the movement towards repair which is simply what the term reparations means, began long before any of us were born, okay? And so what that means is that we have a huge responsibility in this generation to not limit our vision as to what that repair means, how our ancestors have articulated that repair vision, what our responsibility is in this current time, and also to ensure that when we envision repair, that it's not just looking at our current circumstances and the world that we live in today. So one of the things that uh, I've been, I think, quite honored, uh, I'm really pleased to be doing at this time, is some research of activists here in the UK. I'm inviting people who have been organizing around the issue of reparations to participate in a research study on the history of reparations activism in Britain. And so this is coming on to the implications for our African case in Britain. And I can say I haven't interviewed all the people that I need to interview, but from the few interviews that I've done thus far, one of the questions that I ask uh, activists who represent various organisations and movements and so forth is what are their reparations goals? What are their organisational reparations goals? And what is their understanding of the overall goals of the reparations movement? Whether people see it as a UK movement, as a Pan-African movement, as a Pan-Caribbean movement, etc. And I can say that some of the answers that I'm getting that I think are quite instructive is that people say a whole range of things. And it, 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 it kind of ranges from financial compensation to, uh, and I'd say, one end, um, other things around restoring our history, our culture, our identity, etc., etc. A lot of what's already been said. But then a, another end of that, which doesn't often get spoken about, that I want to just share with you, is that one of the reparations goals that some activists in particular, who have been part of various liberation struggles throughout the, the generations, have said, is that ultimately, if we're looking at uh, restoring ourselves, because essentially, even within European paradigms of law, uh, it is recognized that rest the, uh, reparation sorry, must, as far as possible, undo all of the harmful effects of the various forms of oppression that we talk about. So that's chattel enslavement, colonialism, and neo-colonialism. So, if we're going to undo, and, there's a, and we haven't got time to go into all of the effects and the legacies, we all know what that is, okay? But if we are to seriously undo that, I do not feel that we can say that our reparations goal has always been restricted to financial compensation, mm -hmm. okay? And so I have to state that very clearly. But it's not a disagreement because I've already said that this is a space where we welcome all of these perspectives and they are all very much part of how we form our overall strategy and our tactics, okay? So one of the goals has actually been, which is not just this generation, is actually a pan-African nation state. And I'm not talking about uh, African Union, uh, <coughs> un the union of the African states at present that they're talking about. I'm talking about this notion of a Pan-Africa that actually incorporates all of its diasporas across the world. And that is a vision that we have never achieved, never mm. achieved, okay? Since we left the continent, many of us, our parents, our ancestors, whatever, hundreds, hundreds of years ago. And so this Pan-African vision is recognizing that we have to develop a strategic, global, political, legal identity, okay? Which at present we don't have. So if you're born in Britain, they'll say you're black British. If we're in the Caribbean, we're Jamaican, we're Bajans, we're this, we're that. We're African-American here, we're Afro-descendants in, in South America. 
And so what we have is a global population of people who have experienced similar journeys, but yet we don't have this recognition of our commonality. Yes. And we often do this thing, we love to do it. The Jews got this, and the this got that, and the that got that. But we don't look at what they did. So-called Jewish people are not a homogenous community. They came together around a strategic, yes. legal, yes. geopolitical yeah. identity. Yes. 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 And many people respect that. And so none of us are going anywhere far unless we rise to that occasion as well. And of course, the, the, the jury's still out, but most of us, I think, would probably agree that identity is an African identity. Yes? yes. And so in that way, we, we cannot separate any case and claims in Britain from the global strategy and the global issues of reparations interest of our people worldwide, in the Caribbean, in the rest of Europe, in the Americas, in Australasia, in Oceania, all over, and in Africa. And we have to ensure that no section of our global community, which is a nation in formation, mm -hmm. that is not Africa of today, with uh, the borders that Europeans left, that we maintain. That's not what ta we're talking about. When we're talking about repatriation, the limited conceptualization is repatriation to a specific existing country. But our ancient, ancient right to repatriation is a right to the whole continent. Word, word. Because even if we look at whatever, if we know our ancestries and where we've come from, we know that our people traveled. Yeah. Yeah. So we can't just restrict yeah. ourselves to one particular place. Yeah. And so this is part of the historic mission that we have to recognize and we must not betray at this time in this generation. We must also recognize that whatever we do has to think of future generations. Okay? Now, if we're talking about being African, let's also think African. Let's also conceptualize repair in an African way. But we talk about being African and we love to use European frameworks and dichotomies. That's right, that's right. Talk it, my girl. Okay? So we have to get beyond that. And that's where the self-repairs come in, mm -hmm. which must accompany the external stuff, whether we say it's governments, whatever, whatever, multinationals, whatever, whatever. But ultimately, there are two dimensions to the repair. The internal, which is what we have to do for ourselves, what we owe each other, and then the external, and there is no dichotomy. The two work hand in hand. So we don't need to get into debates about whether one is whatever. That's what it is. And it's problematic if we keep talking about reparations and restricting that to financial compensation. That's not what the term that's means. Right, right. It's not my language, but I'm saying that's not what the term means. Mm -hmm. It's never meant that. Within the European um, Convention on Human Rights, within the United Nations frameworks, which have been shaped by all the peoples of the world, there is a recognition that reparations must be holistic, must be comprehensive, must be all-encompassing. There are five key strands. The first one is cessation and guarantees of non-repetition. And what that means is that if we are continuing to experience violations, which we are, neo-colonialism, racism, we can go on, they have to stop. How can you start repairing something mm -hmm. when you're still mm -hmm. in it? Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We have to put a yes. stop. Whether we're saying we're being deprived of our resources in Africa, we have to ensure that stops. Yes. And cessation means governments who are exploiting our natural resources. <laughs> so many of us now, we're talking about credit crunch and all of this. They're cutting people's means of survival. Yes. It's because we are being denied our rightful inheritance. <laughs> So cessation, key aspect of, in terms of the first steps to repairing, you have to put a stop to the injuries that are continuing to be meted out. Then we have restitution, which means to put us back in the position we would have been in had slavery, 
colonialism, contemporary neo-colonialism, um, global apartheid, racism, you name it. Arabism. Had all these things not occurred, Arabism. where would we be? And this is not saying we're going back 500 years or 2,000 years. <coughs> okay? That's restitution. And people talk about Jews, but they don't mention the first act of so-called reparations for Jews was establishing the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just financial compensation. Yes. It was establishing a homeland. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, come on. Okay? Restitution. And that means our right to have restituted to us, given back to us, our lost citizenship, our lost inheritance. So repatriation comes onto that. Okay, the right to have restored all of our wealth, all of our arts, our artifacts, everything. Our, um, uh, our place, our family lineages, all of that restitution. Okay, then we have our satisfaction, which are measures that we put in place to ensure that we feel satisfied that we've had some measure of justice. So that's normally things like commemoration days and changing the curriculum and whatever, whatever. The whole range of things, symbolic, they call it reparations. So changing the street names and reclaiming our names and blah, 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 blah. Whole range of things, can't go into it fully now. We also have compensation. Now this is within mainstream European United Nations frameworks. This is what it is. And it's not that they coined it, they have simply taken global and universal principles that come from all the peoples of the world, especially us, as the first peoples on the planet Earth. Okay? And the most injured. Compensation is not just about money. Compensation is about putting a material value on many things, so that's loss of dignity. Loss of reputation, loss of standing. Who are we today? Are we doing the jobs that we're qualified? Are we uh, being loss underemployed? Or are we having to just do jobs to fit in? We know what the unemployment rate is. So compensation is all of that. It's all about when we're talking about trade and all of that. All, we're, all everything we're losing, all the subsidies <coughs> that are going to European farmers, that is really not going to our, our, our farmers in the Caribbean, yeah, that's yeah. impacting the whole region, yeah, that yeah. survives on tourism. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that we know that that is, so, that is literally causing death for our people. Because yes. many of us are supporting our families back home mm -hmm. who rely on remittances, who rely on the barrels, yes. who unfortunately many of our brothers and sisters now having to rent to this and rent to that and mm -hmm. selling this and selling that to survive. That's the reality. Compensation. So it's really putting a material price. Compensation also is about land restitution. What is the value of our loss of land rights? Why are we here, like, all like in concrete jungle, to high rise, all the crime? Why? Why are we squeezed up like in this country even? So-called 60-odd million of us live on less than 10% of the landmass in this country. Mm. In fact, about 5%. So when you're driving on the motorway and you see all that land, who does it belong to? But then they have us all in these urban areas and then they say, oh, immigrants. And now many of us are saying, oh, no more foreigners should come here. <laughs> like as if we're not the foreigners to these people. <laughs> yeah? Although we've been here a long time, we were here before then, but that's another story. Okay? Compensation. And then we also have uh, rehabilitation. How we rehabilitate ourselves, restore ourselves. That, I'm, I'm, I don't want to use the word healing because it's misunderstood, but that includes social welfare services, legal services, all the all the, the counselling we never had, all of those community support services, our family strengthening and building services, everything that helps rehabilitate us so that we can stand as human beings, as equal, not to them, but to each other. Yes. Yeah? And the guarantees of non-repetition, which go with the cessation, but I always end it, I leave it last. That's vital. And in our repair struggle, 
Because we don't have a holistic 360 degree view around this, we emphasize one over the other. No, it's compensation. No, it should be rehabilitation. No, it's this. No. And negotiate. They've emphasized that it's about diplomacy, partnership mm. with the European governments, the European Union, diplomacy and dialogue. And it's about reforming the post-2015 development agenda around the Millennium Development Goals. Which again, if you know anything about all this UN stuff, are these our liberation goals as a people? We might utilize them, okay? But that's not where it starts and that's not where it ends for us, okay? So I need to share about, uh, the, the final point I wanna make is how we relate to the CARICOM initiative. Many people in Britain have said, oh, it's a good thing that our governments are taking up this issue, but there's a problem in the sense that many of us here, some of us are also Caribbean and, and nationals, uh, have citizenship, whether it's legal or by descent, and there is a big issue around how Caribbean governments engage their diasporas. Mm. So if you think that because you call yourself Caribbean, and that somehow they're doing something for you, you're mistaken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they're talking about people who only live in the Caribbean, and there's yeah. a big issue around diasporas and the fact that we don't have the right to vote overseas. And considering over half of our people live outside of the Caribbean, we're all over we're here, we're in Europe, we're in America, we're in Canada, then what does this mean? And then when they sit down and negotiate with Britain now, Britain is going to say to us, well, hang on, well, your people came here as British subjects, colonial citizens. We are dealing with your government. But hold on a minute. When we're being brutalised on the street, which African or Caribbean government comes to our aid? None. Which one? None of them. So we need to be clear on what our status is, our legal and our political status. And I think I need to stop there. Yes. Thank you.